I so appreciate again the song that Dennis and Kathy were singing about the kingdom of God is at hand and about it being a now thing because the word that God gave me as I was asking him this morning can you take now for an answer now I'm going to say a lot of things to you that some of it may sound controversial so let me give this context for some of the statements I'm going to make because sometimes we have to emphasize something to a degree that if you're not listening or if it trips your wire, you might think I'm saying something I'm not saying. Well, in talking about the kingdom of God and the way I'm going to talk about it tonight, I'm speaking by emphasis and not by exclusion. I say many times, uh, listen to what I'm saying and what I'm not saying. <laughs> And, I mean, what I do say gets me in, in enough uh, of a jam, let alone what I don't say. <laughs> but the kingdom of God, is it now or is it later? Five times in the New Testament we find statements that the kingdom of God is at hand. What does this mean? What is the kingdom? I don't assume. I read those things. I don't assume what it is. What does this mean? In Matthew 10, 7, Jesus, there's a, some things Jesus said and some things that were done that give us an idea of what he meant when he said that. He said, as you go, preach, saying, the kingdom of heaven is at hand. And for my purposes, the kingdom of God, the kingdom of heaven are synonymous. I realize some people split hairs over that and that's okay with me if you do but for the purposes of this what I'm saying to, tonight the kingdom of heaven the kingdom of God are interchangeable for me as you go preach saying the kingdom of heaven is at hand how do we know that heal the sick cleanse the lepers raise the dead cast out devils freely you have received freely give freely you have received what Freely you have received the kingdom. So he was implying by what he was telling them to go do. He wasn't saying you're going to go heal the sick, cleanse the leper, raise the dead one day. No, he was saying go do it now because you have received all of the resources of heaven necessary to go out and be the God man and the God woman you've been called to be. Uh, Jesus did not come to model for us the extraordinary life. He came to model for us uh, what normal Christians were intended to look like. He is the ultimate normal Christian. Hello? <laughs> Anything that falls uh, outside of that boundary that Jesus would represent uh, is subnormal. So in your aspiration uh, uh, as a child of God, let, you, uh, let it, your heart say, I am aspiring to be normal as Jesus modeled it for us on the earth when he said, uh, and then he went a step further, says, not only are you going to do the things that I've done, but you're even going to do greater. So what was it they had received? They had received the kingdom. And having received the kingdom, they were to release the kingdom. And if we're to release the kingdom, we better know where the kingdom is. I have a poster of a little baby with a great big goofy grin on his face and the caption is, I get it. I want it. Now, where is it? <laughs> because we get enthused. We, we have the zeal, but we don't have the information. You know, the, the purposes of God are not only uh, in the energy that comes as we respond emotionally, to who God is in our lives, but there's also information that directs who he is at things in your life, things in the lives of those around you, and that's called heal the sick, cleanse the leper, raise the dead, cast out devils. He didn't say find out what their name is. He didn't say, you know, let's, let's have an interview like Donahue with the, with the demon. Mm -hmm. No, you just expose and expel. Amen. Shut up and come out. Uh, in, Ma in Matthew 6.10 and in Luke 11.12, Jesus said to pray, 
Thy kingdom come. Okay, thy kingdom come when? Now or later? Now. Is he praying, Lord, to pray your kingdom will come, your linear purpose in time. There's going to come a time that the kingdom of God is going to come, and we're going to participate in it. I've been in so many conferences over the years that we're talking about someday. This is what God's going to do someday. And I was looking at one meeting I was in, 2,000 people filled with those that needed to get saved, needed to get healed, needed to get delivered, and they were all excited about someday, and those people left there without their needs met because they weren't willing to take now for an answer. Come on. See, when, when we pray, thy kingdom come, we are praying into our now because now God... God is not a God of the past. The future hasn't been created yet. Now is the only envelope of time that God has to be God in your life. That's right. God wants you to be now Mm. oriented. Come on. When Jesus and John declared that the kingdom of God was at hand, they were saying to their generation, there are aspects of the kingdom you are putting off to the future that are available now as an inward resource to change your life and the lives of others. It's like Kitty says many times, you know, we have trouble believing God for the rent and we're believing him that, you know, a God that we've never seen is going to take us after death to a heaven that we've never been to. And we, 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 trust him supposedly for those big ticket items and we're having trouble trusting him for the small things come on romans 8 says that god who spared not his only son how shall he not freely with him give us all things let me quote it again you find this in romans 8 if god spared not his only son but gave him for us, how shall he not, how shall God not, with him, with Jesus, freely give us all things, and the implication is any lesser gift. So whatever we can ask of him, Jesus is all, Jesus said all power is given unto me in heaven and earth. The only thing uh, God had left after Jesus came to the earth was Jesus himself. Jesus is all he has to give you. There's a book by Watchman Nee called Christ the Sum of All Spiritual Things. Mm-hmm. It will revolutionize your life in terms of believing God for supply and answer prayer. Because if he's given you Jesus, Jesus is the packet in which all of these other things are available to you. All power in heaven and in earth. The only thing that Jesus doesn't have is the date for his return. Uh-huh. Because if God gave it to him, he would have to tell us. Because he said, everything that the Father's given to me, I'm giving it to you. Amen. And so can't you see the? I got a good relationship with my dad. Can't you see Jesus and the Father? And Jesus is sitting there at the right hand of the Father. He's stroking his beard and he's smiling. He says, come on, Dad. Come on. Cough give it, it to me. Cough it up. And the Father <laughs> winks at him and says, uh-uh, you're not talking me into that one. It's not time yet. Because anything... That has been given to Jesus, yes, we Lord. automatically have access to. Thank you, Father. He's your healer. He's your savior. He's yes. your deliverer. He's all what? What do you? He's your rent payment. He's yes. your utility payment. He's your promotion. Uh, yes. Your advancement is not uh, at the whim of a boss who doesn't care whether you live or die. Nope. Your advancement, your promotion, and your blessing is determined by the favor of God who causes your enemies to be at peace with you, who sets a table for you in the presence of your enemies. Yeah. So uh, Acts 14.22 says, It is through much tribulation you enter the kingdom. Let's, the word tribulation means manifold pressure, heat upon heat. Let's learn to push into the pressure because when you push into the pressure, you break out into the kingdom. Woo-hoo! And the kingdom of God is righteousness, Peace and joy. We're going to talk a little more about that. God wants you. Yeah, repeat it. Acts 14.22 says it is. Okay, Acts 14.22. Paul did his first missionary journey. And he went out and everywhere he went, he invoked riots. People got beat up. They got thrown in jail. They would let him down in a basket. Uh, and every time trouble broke out, he would say, see you guys later and leave. And he didn't ordain one elder. He didn't set up leadership. He just said, sorry for your luck. I'm headed to the next town. Mm -hmm. And uh, then on his second missionary journey, he pulled up 
short, and his second missionary journey was going backwards over his first missionary journey to every city he had been to uh, from the beginning of that first uh, assignment. And he said he went back to each of those cities where he'd stirred up all the trouble and all the people got saved, and those that had turned the world upside down have come here also. And he did two things. He confirmed the souls of the saints. You studied that word confirm out. It meant he had prophetic presbytery, and he got out his little recorder, and he prophesied over every one of them. Come on. He confirmed the souls of the saints, and he exhorted them, Acts 14, 22, that it is through much tribulation that you enter the kingdom. And the word tribulation does not... Uh, define is not defined as God putting something on you that the cross took off of you. That's right. He never says no to what the cross says yes to. Amen. So whatever that tribulation is, it has nothing to do with anything Jesus died to get off of you. Mm-hmm. The word means pressure. It means manifold pressure. And so you as a believer, you need to learn how to make the chaos decision and press into the pressure that's pushing in on you. When you push into the pressure, you break out into the kingdom. kingdom. Woo! Woo! Amen. Amen. And the kingdom Great of God is righteousness, peace, and joy. You have to understand, you cannot be defiled by the pressure of the world when you realize you have within you a river of, of life springing up to life everlasting. Come on. In the old covenant, uh, anything that was... Clean, if it was touched by something unclean, then that which is clean became unclean. In other words, unclean things in the Old Testament, in the law, contaminated clean things with one exception, running water. You can put anything unclean into running water, and the running water, the river of living living, uh, water in you, cannot be contaminated. Mm -hmm. And so you learn to pray this prayer, greater is the pressure on the inside, flowing Mm -hmm. out than the pressure on the outside yes, trying to God. get in. We play Woo! till I win. Amen. Yeah. Amen. That's Amen. good news. Yeah. Let's, Let's, can we do that together? Yeah, you uh, should have okay. them that. Okay. Greater is the pressure, pressure on, the on the inside, inside flowing out, out than the, the pressure, pressure on the outside, outside trying, trying to get, get in. in. We play, we play till, I win. till I win. Amen. <laughs> and let me throw in here, this is when we usually teach, that too many people think about the enemy out there as a principality and a power. Because greater is he that's in us than he that's in the world. You are a principality and a power. Start walking, talking, and acting like it. You're the principality and the power because the greater glory is on the inside of you. He just tried to keep us from knowing that. God put you in your life like he put Adam and Eve in the garden. You're called to be a tender and a keeper. Amen. He told Adam to subdue his jurisdiction. That word subdue, it's a word picture of what fire does to anything combustible. It consumes. Mm. You need to learn to take authority to not act like a victim in your jurisdiction. Come on. Paul said, I don't boast myself beyond my measure. But he knew who he was an apostle to and who he wasn't an apostle to. And those where he knew he had apostolic authority, he stood his ground. And you have rule. You have the rule of God. We're kings and priests unto God. Now, how are we supposed to be, if you are a king and priest unto God, and there are many references throughout the the New Testament that say so, how are you supposed to be a king? Are we supposed to look at at, uh, examples in history as how kings act? No, our daddy is a king. That means in your situation, what are we going to do? I'm going to, I'm going to do what God would do if he was in my shoes because I'm supposed to be, according to Ephesians, I'm supposed to be a follower of God, an imitator of God as a dear child. Amen. If God was in your position, married to that spouse, laying his head down in that house, driving that car, working that job, what would he be doing? He did not look out at that which was void and and without form and say, it sure is dark out there. Mm-mm. He wasn't wringing his hands. He wasn't, he wasn't stressing out. What did he do? He said, light be. He spoke the thing desired, desired. because out of, the, abundance. out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. Amen. Life and death are in the power of the tongue. Yes. Out of the heart are the issues of life. Those that indulge it shall eat the fruit thereof. Through your faith-filled words. Yes, Jesus. <laughs> but God wants you to become now oriented where his kingdom is concerned. Matthew 6.33 says, seek first the kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be added unto you. Okay, seek first the kingdom, his righteousness. But then the next thing he says in verse 34 says, take no thought for tomorrow. 
So he wants you to seek his kingdom and his righteousness in the context of today. Many times we're being crushed by pressure and stress because we're trying to apply grace for today to the next six months. And we're borrowing trouble. It's like the guy that said, I've had a lot of troubles in my life. Most of them never did happen. <laughs> See, we're borrowing trouble when the, the grace of God, the full outpouring of the grace of God in your life is only there and it's des- designed to sustain you in your now. Come on. I'm not trying to hold on till Jesus comes. Mm-mm. I'm not waiting for what's going to happen today. I'm going to have victory and put my foot in the devil's neck before I close my eyes to go to sleep tonight. Wow. And that is your portion. Mm-hmm. Glory to God. If we're seeking the kingdom, where do we find it? Mm-hmm. Okay, uh, in West, the Western world is built on the underpinnings of, of Greek philosophy and Greek history, and they had an idea of Zeus on top of a mount, Mount Olympus, sitting on a throne, hurling thunderbolts down at his hapless victims. In other words, we have an otherly orientation about God, uh, an austere old man with a long gray beard. But is that the picture? That we see in the New Testament? Is that how Jesus... See, we have to look at everything through the lens of who Jesus is. Mm-hmm. If we're seeking the kingdom, Romans fourteen seventeen says, The kingdom of God is not meat and drink. In other words, you don't find the kingdom by applying yourself to religious culture no. or acquiescing to uh, the external infrastructure of religious culture. The kingdom of God is not meat and drink, but it's righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Ghost. This is what the kingdom is. It may be other things in terms of God's linear purpose through time, but this is what the kingdom is right now. It's righteousness. That word righteousness means entitlement. 1 Corinthians 1.30, God made Jesus to be your righteousness. That means your righteousness is, not, is, a, your righteousness is a person, not a performance. Amen. God it made your righteousness just like your truth. My truth is a person. That's why I have so many questions. Because my truth is a person. And I'm willing to stand before God with my questions than I am with everybody else's answers. But my truth is the person of Jesus. Yes. And he's my righteousness. I know God moves in my life because of who Jesus is and what he has done and what who I am and what I have done or not done are trumped by who Jesus is and what he did for me 2,000 years ago, which is why we pray in the name of Jesus. I'm not asking you to do this for me, Jesus. I'm asking you to do this because of who you are and what you did for me 2,000 years ago. The kingdom of God is entitlement. You, we are Lord. entitled because of who Jesus is and what who you are does not negate that entitlement you are entitled to the benefits of calvary because of what jesus did and what you have done or not done does not negate that and so you stand boldly you come boldly by the way hebrews says that he has consecrated it's his consecration that brings you into that entitlement and your lack of consecration will be addressed in his presence because you will see him and you will be like him Anything, uh, any disparity between your character and his gets dealt with in his presence. Mm -hmm. You try and deal with it before you go to God and it's like wrestling with a greased pig. You get all over you what's all over him. Mm -hmm. And you're defeated. That's what Romans 7 talks about. Who's going to deliver me from the body of this death? I thank my God through Jesus Christ. You come into his presence, you are forever changed by who he is and what he has done, working as an agent upon who you are and what you have done transforming your life. It's peace. The, the kingdom of God is peace. And that word comes from a word that means to join. It means prosperity. I love the, the Second Chronicles 2020, the prophetic. It says, believe the prophet, so shall you prosper. Believe the Lord, so shall you be established. Many people are established, but they're not prospering because they don't believe in the prophetic. Now, if you're established but not prospering, what is that? That's food stamps. <laughs> I'm established. And don't feel bad if you're on food stamps. Okay. I've probably spent more of my adult life in a food stamp office than you have. So I'm not putting you down if you're on food stamps. I'm just simply saying that uh, being established but not prospering, that's stagnation. Yeah. And God has something more for you. And he actually cut off 20%. He, uh, he uh, committed 20% of the five-fold ministry to your prosperity. 
believe the prophet, so shall you prosper. The word pe- the kingdom of God is righteousness and peace. It means prosperity, quietness. Hello. <laughs> I raised three kids. Right? <laughs> quietness. Four. Four kids. He has four. When a, you know, I used to smile. One of my six. highest aspirations <laughs> a, 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 as a man for many years was, when do I get to come home? When will I go for one week and come home and not have a cruiser with the lights on in my driveway? <laughs> Hello? <laughs> the kingdom of God is quietness, peace, <laughs> tranquility, <laughs> harmony, security. So you don't have to make security your highest value. The kingdom of God will secure you Amen. in your now. Yes. Safety and contentment. It's also joy. I mean, God's not willing for you to live without joy. That's right. To be cheerful, it means to be well off. Hello? Amen. <laughs> Where's all the money going to come from? Let me say this to you. Money moves by the Spirit. And when you, I have, I have made moves in the spirit that were financial suicide. I moved. I couldn't afford an employee. I moved 130 miles from the only way I had to make a living, because God told me to. And it exploded in prosperity around me in a supernatural way. Money moves by the spirit, and if you learn how to move by the spirit, money will find you. Seek first the kingdom, and all these things will be added. If you're seeking, if you manage to pull off seeking first the kingdom, if all those things cannot be added, then God's word is a lie. The scripture cannot be broken. So it's to be well off, to live, I like this, joy, to live in calm delight. <laughs> when? Now. Now, right now. So what is your focus? Is it now or later? Can you take now for an answer? In Luke 17, verses 12 through 18, Jesus spontaneously heals ten lepers. And these Pharisees come out, and they were like first century evangelicals, right? They come out, and they see that he heals the ten lepers, and they start demanding of him when the kingdom shall come. And the ten lepers are standing there saying, Hello? They want to have a theological argument. When's the kingdom going to come? They saw the ten lepers cleansed. If you would have asked one of the ten lepers, they would have said, the kingdom just came, guys. (laughs) It's righteousness. It's peace. It's joy. See, they had a religious mindset that didn't see changed lives as the sign of the kingdom coming. They had had lepers all their lives. And they simply fit them into their worldview by pronouncing them unclean. This happens in the modern day when we pronounce people unclean, unfit, illegal, unwelcome. Come on. And there's a word for that. Xenophobia. And the church is extremely xenophobic. Jesus did not tag people. He changed Amen. And he didn't do it by political process. No. And he didn't do it by military intervention. Zechariah 4 6 says, It's not by might and it's not by power, but it's by my spirit, saith the Lord. There is coming to the church that which will be called the great disillusionment. When they finally find out that the political process has completely abandoned them. And it's going to bring a great despair in the church but it's going to have a good result it's going to bring them to their knees and birth a new great awakening Amen. Jesus didn't tag people he changed people the Pharisees knew they didn't have what it took to change people so they simply labeled them the person you label dismiss with a wave of your hand or look the other way that viewpoint results from a deficit of kingdom in you, kingdom now, understanding. And so in verse 17, chapter 17, verse 20, he's demanded of the Pharisees, when will the kingdom of God come? And he says, the kingdom of God does not come with observation. Mm. Neither shall they say, lo here or lo there, for behold, the kingdom of God is within you. Amen. In other words, Jesus is saying, 
No, no, that you're getting the wrong answers because you aren't even asking the right questions. <laughs> they wanted to understand God's linear purpose through time. And there is something called God's linear purpose through time. He steps through time. If you study history, God steps through time, through human history, in 500-year strides. And we are at one of those junctures right now. Amen. 500 years ago, slavery came. African slaves came to, the, to North America 500 years ago. 500 years ago, Martin Luther nailed his 99 theses on the door of the Wittenberg Chapel and the Protestant Revolu uh, Reformation was, was born. We're due to see the fingerprint of God in human events on that, on that scale. They wanted to understand God's linear purpose through time, but he wanted them to look at the kingdom in there now. See, not that God doesn't have a linear purpose, but he said your focus should be occupied till I come. You live, plan, and conduct yourself in terms of your practical theology as though he's never coming back. But you're not going to be disappointed if he comes back before we get home tonight. Amen. He has my permission. Amen. Does he have yours? Yes. He, in effect, is saying to them, whatever the kingdom is, it is in you now. The kingdom is not an external something, external to you in time or place. The kingdom you are seeking is in your now, and it is a resource to produce now what you've always thought it takes until then to see happen. You don't have to die to rule and reign, for instance. Amen. What is it about death? Death is the last enemy. And we think we'll understand it better by and by, and we get to heaven, everything's going to be kosher. But what is it about death that God requires the instrumentality of death to accomplish that he can't accomplish in your now, right now? Uh -huh. See, the kingdom of God is within you. And the kingdom that is not in you, now listen to me, the kingdom that is not in you is not the kingdom. Paul talked about another Jesus. I am concerned that you've been seduced away from the simplicity that is in Christ to another Jesus. Mm. The Jesus that is not in you. The kingdom that is not in you is not the kingdom that Jesus died to activate and bring as a resource into your life. Come on. It's a distraction. Mm -hmm. You might ask, so, well, what, what is the kingdom? If the kingdom doesn't come with, with observation, then how does it come? Remember what James said. What's the opposite of observation? Participation. Now, I'm going to give you some keys here. That you, can, you don't have to wait for a prophetic word. I'm going to give you some keys as I finish tonight that you can walk yourself into any magnitude of breakthrough you've got the audacity to believe for. Come on. If the kingdom of God doesn't come with observation, the opposite of observation is participation. James talked about in James 1.22, Be doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving your own selves. Here's the problem with hearers and preachers, and I've been a pastor and preacher my whole life. Here's how preachers deceive themselves. God tells them to do something, and they go preach it to the people and delude themselves into thinking they did something with the word, but they didn't. It's kind of like whenever you have siblings and mom tells you to clean your room and you go get them and says, Mom said for you to clean my room. <laughs> See? And so preachers need to learn and ministry leaders need to learn how not to feed people off of their plate. You, you take what God gives you and apply it to your life and then you go feed the people what God tells you to. Mm -hmm. Or you walk in delusion. And if you're walking in delusion, all you can do is reproduce delusion. And we've got a, a generation of people who are more observational than they are participational. And they're not seeing the kingdom come that's righteousness, peace and joy, entitlement, well-being, and calm delight. Just saying. It's been said that we're a Joseph generation. We've heard that and heard that and heard that. The more I read about Joseph, the more I'm not sure I want to be a part of the Joseph generation. Betrayed, <laughs> yeah, all the things Joseph oh, went through, falsely pit. accused, thrown in a pit. Hey, we qualify. Ignored. <laughs> and we've all done our time there. It's been said we're a Joseph generation. In Genesis 39, 22, it says in his generation, anything that was done, he was the doer of it. Come on. The Joseph generation is going to be a company of doers because of what the kingdom of God is on the inside of them. The church has been marginalized in our society 
because we've ceased to be doers and demonstrators of the kingdom. You don't have to talk about what you demonstrate. That's why I love the prophetic. Amen. See, whenever we didn't have signs, miracles, and wonders and had 400 silent years between uh, Malachi and Matthew, what was the answer? Send a prophet. What did the prophet do? The demonstration of the Spirit and the prophet activated the demonstration of power in Jesus. John the Baptist, who did no miracles, activated Jesus in his miracle ministry. So what's the answer when we're not seeing unimpeachable, unimpeachable miracles that the world cannot marginalize and the church cannot ignore? What's the answer? The prophetic. The prophetic is here to bring the demonstration of the Spirit. I can demonstrate the Spirit, prophesy into your life, and instantly bring you to a decision. I'm either a nutcase or it's God. Because the demonstration makes a decision. And then we're going to, the day will come that you and I will walk in demonstration of power with the same fluency that we have come to walk in the demonstration of the Spirit through the prophetic. Okay. Because the prophetic that doesn't do miracles activates the miracle ministry. And you and I are going to get to be a participator in that. Luke seventeen twenty three. Jesus concludes, he says, they will say, see, here is Christ, or lo, there is Christ. He says, don't go after them. In other words, those with an otherly orientation. They're looking. First John, the last verse of First John says, little children, keep yourself from idols. The letter of First John was written to the most spiritual congregation you could imagine. They were not bowing down to bricks. Mm -hmm. I said, why did you tell these mature believers not to uh, worship idols? He said, idolatry proposes the dwelling place of God to be somewhere other than the human heart. Idolatry proposes some other dependency other than who Jesus is in your heart and life. You know the temple, he told me another thing, you know the temple of the idol by the buildings in your community where you're expected to whisper? <laughs> Banks, hospitals, other places, hello, library, churches, buildings with... Phallic symbols on top of them we call steeples. Hello? See, things are the way they are because of what we've been doing. If we want something different, we've got to do something different, not believe something different. Right. We have to do something different. So they'll say, lo, here is Christ. Lo, there is Christ. He says, don't follow them. The kingdom of God is within you. Leaders today step on toes, and they point to the kingdom that will come one day. Jesus washed feet and pointed to the kingdom that's in you. Amen. Now. Paul said in Colossians 1, 26 and 27 that his, the mystery of his gospel was Christ in you, the hope of glory. Christ in you is the hope of glory. Christ in me is not your hope of glory. That's right. Christ in you is your father. Christ in me is just your brother. God wants you to love your brother. <laughs> Amen. But your, fidel your first fidelity is to who he is on the inside of you. He did not die. He did not go to the cross to, to establish a telegraph relationship through, Christian infra through religious infrastructure to maintain some relationship to you. He died to take up residence on the inside of you and manifest his kingdom, his entitlement, his blessing, and his breakthrough inside of you as a column of fire, as a pillar of smoke Come that on. changes your life and the lives of all of those around you. And Paul goes on to say, he says, this is the Christ in you is what we're preaching, what we're warning every man, what we're teaching every man in all wisdom and in all godliness. I'm not here to warn you about anything or anyone or to say that the sky is falling because I'm here to tell you the sky isn't falling the kingdom is coming and it's in you amen I said again the sky isn't falling the kingdom is coming thank you Lord. and the kingdom is in you amen. it'll pay your bills it'll straighten out your relationships it'll heal your body what do you need it to be fill in the blank all means all. Seek first the kingdom. That's an inward search. Frightening. <laughs> intimidating because it's easy. Like Thomas, we want, to, we want something external. We need to learn to have dependence upon who he is on the inside of you. Amen. How do you do that? I'm going to give you five 
quick. We're not even going to read the verses. You can have the intelligence of a turnip and still walk yourself Amen. into breakthrough. Amen. Do some very simple things. You can say, oh, man, it's, I can't wrap my head around this. You don't have to. Here's some simple things that will help you. Write these verses down. John 5, 19. I only do what I see my father do. you got to quit eating from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Walter and Kathleen taught a lot on that. Uh You have to learn how not to eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil and only partake of the tree of life. I only do what I see my father do. Jesus went to the pool of Bethesda in John 5, healed one guy and left with a clean conscience, and he insulted that guy before he healed him. How can he do that? And do it with a clean conscience because he only did what he saw the Father do. That's, that's the difference between his track record and yours. You can experience the greater works by starting off saying, I'm only going to do what I see my Father Amen. do. Amen. Number two, Matthew 7, 1. Judge not that you be not judged. That is not the gospel according to Rodney King. The word judge there means to have an opinion. You have to learn how not to have an opinion. Do what you see the Father do and have no opinion about what happens next. (laughs) Because what happens next? Turbulence. And you get bounced out of the potato wagon. And let me tell you something. I understand that. My life was almost destroyed after 20 years of understanding no opinion. Because I could not refrain from having an opinion in a critical moment. Do what you see the Father do and have no opinion opinion about what happens next. Matthew 7, 1. And then, see, having no opinion deals with your mind. But then John 12, 24, Jesus said, unless a seed fall into the ground and die, it abides alone. But if it falls into the ground and dies, it springs up and bears much fruit. And the fruit was resurrection. The fruit was you and I sitting here tonight. See, that deals with your heart. It talks about relinquishing the outcome. Jesus said, unless you take up your cross and follow me, if you're not living in self-denial, if you're not relinquishing the outcome, you're not going to endure the turbulence that comes when you do what you see the Father do. Amen. How do I know what the Father wants me to do? He holds himself responsible to see that you get it. He will have somebody walk up to you in Walmart and say, you don't know me, but I think I'm supposed to say this to you. You will drive down the road and see a billboard. You will turn on the radio and somebody will be singing a song. You will run in, you will run headlong into the synchronicity of God, the serendipity of God, by which he will make it abundantly clear to you, as he did confirming this word tonight, that it's God talking and what he wants you to do, and it's up to you to obey and to have no opinion about what happens next and relinquish the outcome because you're setting your affection on things above, not on having an impact in your personal life, because if you're just in it for yourself, you will not survive the turbulence that comes when you do what you see the Father do. Your friends won't get it. Your family won't get it. It's not going to change their mind. It's going to reveal what they thought about you all along. But if you will hold your course, I will have no opinion. I will do what I see the Father do. I will relinquish the outcome. You will break out into the kingdom in a supernatural way and the enemy will wake up and see he's got a principality and a power on his hands and you're intimidating him, keeping him up at night rather than him keeping you up at night. Amen. Let's do that. Let's do that. Let's have that. John 12, 24, relinquish the outcome so you do what you see the father do have no opinion about what happens next relinquish the outcome and then John 3 8 make the chaos decision the chaos decision is one that your brain says you are out of your mind <laughs> good good that's good <laughs> Jesus told them to Nicaragua yeah. you know <laughs> poster child for the chaos decision yeah. over Jesus told Nicodemus in John 3, 8, the wind, he that is born of the Spirit is like the wind. You don't know where he's coming from and you don't know where he's going. Why? Because he's not responding out of the mind. He's listening to the first witness, the nuance of the Spirit, the distillation of the Spirit of God confirmed in your life, stepping out in the audacity of faith. It's not trying to screw up your faith and be, be bold. No, you're just doing what you see the Father do. And guess what? Not only are people not going to understand what you're doing, 
You're not going to know what you're, what are you doing? I don't know. I don't really know. <laughs> it's the chaos decision. Just being led. See? <laughs> See, the chaos decision is simply the decision that you make in line with God's plan for your life that is so broad that when you look at it, it looks like chaos. But if you look at it through the instrumentation of his viewpoint, you see the, his perfect pattern because he knows the end from the beginning. Back in the 80s, they thought that you know, at a quantum level, nature sprang out of complete chaos, and they called it chaos theory. 20 years later, they realized it wasn't chaos at all. They just didn't have the instrumentation at the time to see the pattern that was there. They didn't have computers powerful enough to see the pattern that existed, and so what they thought was chaos was simply a pattern beyond their comprehension. And so we have to learn to make the chaos decision, whether it makes sense to your brain or to those around you uh, or, to, uh, or to even to yourself. You That's make right. the chaos decision because it's been confirmed by Almighty God. That's the importance, the utter importance of the rhema word to your life, the prophetic word. The whole point of the prophet is to activate the voice of God in your life. So then you have both blade edges of the double-edged sword, which is the Word of God. And we've been preaching that, and we've been taking people through the motions of putting on their armor and waving their sword and all of this. There's two edges to that blade, and it's called the Logos, which is the unchangeable scripture, but it's the Rhema, which is the subjective Word of God. The scripture is the objective, eternal Word. The Rhema is the subjective, present truth, prophetic Word to you that says, get up, do this, quit your job, get that job, the specific things that he will confirm to you, he's saying. And you have, you, if you are not relying on the Rhema, with the same dependency you're relying on the Logos, you are denying yourself a, a blade edge of the, the uh, purposes of God that will bring you into your fair haven. You see, the Logos is there like the rule book. The Rhema is there like the playbook. And we've been making, rule, we've been making playbook promises for rule book compliance. Mm. Let me say it again. We, we take the rule book as leaders and we say, if you keep the rules, but the rules never won the Super Bowl. We've been taking the rule book and say, adhere to the rule book and you'll make it. We're making playbook promises on rule book compliance because rules are made by elders that like to get to bed early. <laughs> Every church should have a bail fund the same size as their building fund. Hello? Yeah. I mean, I, I'm not your typical pastor because I'm not one of these guys where my highest ethic is uh, uh, still waters and green pastures. My idea of, of the ministry God's called us to is like Samson taking the fox's tails, tying them together, setting them on fire, and sending them through the enemy's barley fields. That's what I want to do to every one of you. Woo-hoo! Yeah. And I'm willing to stand behind the trouble you He's get into it. when you do it. Yeah, we got bail funds. Because you got a lot of mistakes to make because God makes even your mistakes to prosper. Do something. If you do it wrong, you'd yes. be amazed what God will do with your Amen. blunders. Amen. He makes even your mistakes to prosper. So now, having practiced the chaos decision for many years, we eat chaos for breakfast, you guys. It's like we could do chaos on a daily basis because we're only going to do what we see the Father do. That's all he ever asked. Jesus was never unsuccessful at anything. He did not one thing that he did because he only did what he saw the Father do. And so many years I was programmed to do somebody's thing, help somebody do their thing and promote their thing. And they didn't teach me that Christ in me was my hope of glory and that's when I got success. As soon as I started saying, Father, what do you say? What do you want? He'd tell me. And I would do it. And it brought me to this precious man of God that I'm married to today. Amen. And the rest is history. You got to say it. Oh, oh, I was seeking first the kingdom of God. And I ran smack dab into Russell Walden. <laughs> He's a mighty man of God, a mighty man of valor. And I celebrate him every single day. That's just what love does. Love promotes. Amen. And you have to know, too, these guys are so newlyweds. Yeah. <laughs> we haven't even had our fourth anniversary. <laughs> now, uh, I really feel this is our stopping place. 